Good evening to all of you and welcome to the Georgia Museum of Art. I want to particularly welcome you to our annual Early Strange Lecture, one of which we look forward to each year. Since it commemorates the life and the work of a philanthropist, a progressive, an activist, and a proponent of fine arts education. In short, someone who through the prose of screenwriting and the dialogue of film made poetry of both the spoken and the written word. Mariah Parker will introduce our speaker this evening. Good evening, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to give a couple of thank yous to the Georgia Museum of Art, the Early Strange Fund for Art and Poetry, the Wilson Center for Arts for Humanities and Arts, um, the Mary Frances Early College of Education, including the Office of Research, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Department of Language and Literacy Education. And now a few words about our wonderful speaker this evening. Jamila Liscott is a community-engaged scholar, nationally renowned speaker, and a spoken word artist. She serves as Assistant Professor of Social Justice Education at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and a Senior Research Fellow at Teachers College Columbia University Institute for Urban and Minority Education. Across these spaces, Jamila's work focuses on racial justice, community engagement, and youth activism in education through the lens of what she has termed vision-driven justice. She has been invited to over 100 institutions throughout the nation where she works with youth educators and people across disciplines to inspire vision and action. Her scholarship and activism work together to prepare educators to sustain diversity in the classroom, empower youth, and explore, assert, and defend the value of black life. Jamila is founder and co-director of Cyphers for Justice, a youth research and advocacy program apprenticing NYC high school youth, incarcerated youth, and pre-service educators as critical social researchers through hip-hop, spoken word, and digital literacy. She is the recent recipient of the 2019 AERA Outstanding Public Communication of Education Research Award and the 2019 Scholar Activist Community Advocacy Award. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Jamila Liscott. As this month, we endeavor to celebrate black history and inscribe black futures. I cannot help but reflect on what it must mean to do the work toward racial equity and justice with deep integrity and accountability. As we uphold this moment where we have the privilege to share time and space with each other, I cannot help but reflect on my first visit to Haiti six years ago. We slept in the desert outside of an orphanage that was built by American volunteers just one year prior for children newly displaced by the loss of their parents in the 2010 earthquake. The violence I witnessed, however, in this context had nothing to do with the brokenness of the children. It had nothing to do with hunger or loss or poverty or resilience in the face of all odds. The most violent thing I witnessed in this space, leaving an indelible picture in my mind, was a mural painted by the volunteers who built the orphanage. It was their, act, their last act of kindness, I learned. This floor to ceiling painting which lived on the wall between the children's rooms. The mural featured a caricaturesque depiction of a white American man in a suit and tie, sailing toward a small island where naked black children were jumping and smiling as they awaited his arrival. Every day and every night, upon waking up and upon going to sleep, the children took this image in. You see, the volunteers did not just create a new edifice for the displaced children. They simultaneously re-inscribed an old narrative, a narrative of salvation, a narrative of paternalism, a narrative of inferiority, a narrative of black need met with white benevolence, a narrative 
that insidiously echoed well the history of French colonial violence that is responsible for the Haiti that we know today. And here we are, those of us who are committed to justice, those of us who are committed to equity, those of us who are committed to peace, needing to make sure that every single day our work is not re-inscribing the very harm that we seek to dismantle. I heard through the grapevine that there are two Athens, the predominantly white infrastructure that makes up the University of Georgia, and the poor black communities that surround it yet have no real access. I wonder then, in this work, as faculty, as administrators, as community, as students, if we are serious about justice, will we paint a mural of displacement, marginalization, paternalism, inferiority, salvation? Some of the most abiding questions for those committed to black futures remained, how exactly does one build possibility within a history of pain? How exactly do we inscribe hope within a history of harm? You see, where I'm from, everything broken is beautiful if you give it a reason to survive. I am from a gash the size of a diaspora. We are wounds fighting to remember our skin into existence. Remembering is painful, but still we dance here in these borders with insistence. I am from Calypso. The steel drum is a phoenix of an instrument born from the ashes of slavery in my parents' land from frying pans, dustbins, and oil drums. You see, where I'm from, everything Broken is beautiful if you give it a reason to survive. Where I'm from is alive, and it is loud, and it is proud. I am from roti, roast bake, fried chicken and fish cake, candy yams and fried bake, collard greens and dalpuri, quarter waters and baji, navalatas, icy, paylau, swordfish, pumpsy tape, all day, every day. We milli rocking on every block. We dabbing on them. We bad and bougie. We that onyx opulence that ontological odyssey, thick like the night, black that blinds, boogeyman, black panthers in a broken white house. I am from the pride of culture, but I am also from a scar of shame. Where I'm from, our identities are noosed by the histories in our own last names. We dance in our gashes and make wings from our mother's spines. It is ugly and beautiful, hurtful and healing, all at the very same time. You see, where I'm from, everything broken is beautiful, if you give it a reason to survive. Where I'm from, all six floors of my building call the woman in apartment 10 D Granny. I am not from a broken family, but I am from a broken promise. We are from a gash the size of a diaspora, open and gruesome and honest. Thank you. I begin with this story of where I'm from and some of the context that I've had the, privileges, the privilege to navigate. Because during this Black History Month, and what the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement has invited us to reframe as Black Futures Month, it's really important to me for us to reflect deeply about how we enter into this work. That we don't just pay lip service to what we say when we say we want a more equitable world. And so I want to challenge us. I want to invite us to interrogate the integrity of our work. Each and every person in this room, regardless of your respective area of influence, I want us to think about how are we navigating this work in ways that are rooted critically in reflection, 
accountability and integrity, that's aligned with what we say we want to do in this world. And so the story of my time in Haiti was just a really important example for me of how even with the best of intentions, we can enter into spaces and cause harm under the guise of doing good. Right? Um, this image is another way that I seek to invite us into that accountability. This image, um, first introduced to me by Tuck and Yang um, in their work, it's like for all you, you know, like super academic folks, the citation is here, right? <laughs> um, but in their book, in their work, they shared this image, uh, which is an image that comes from the artistry of Ken Gonzalez Day. And Ken Gonzalez Day created a photograph series called Erased Lynchings. And Erased Lynchings featured some of the most prominent lynchings in the United States, but it removed the body. And by removing the body, what Ken Gonzalez Day invited us to think about was the fact that when we stumble upon this kind of image, we are often so readily drawn to the gruesomeness of the hanging body that we don't pay attention to all that's going on at the bottom. We're often more fixated, transfixed, naturally, by the pain and the horror of what's happening to the person being lynched that we are not paying attention to those who are perpetuating the crime. And so by removing the body, it shifts our gaze. The invitation by these authors in showing us this, this image was to think about the kind of work that we do when we say we're committed to justice and equity in the service of particularly young people of color in the field of education. Because what happens is we end up focused so much on the gruesomeness of what is happening to these young people We'll break out the statistics, we'll name them at risk, we'll, name, we'll label the young people um, in ways that eclipse the systemic factors that are acting upon the situation in the first place. And so it's another invitation for us to think about, well, what are the ways that we are responsible for perpetuating what these authors call uh, damage-centered narratives. The kind of narratives where we go into communities and our desire to make a better world often takes shape in the form of helping in harmful ways, of extracting, of being a savior, of seeing those who are different as damaged, right? So like, a lot of times when I have conversations about racial equity and justice, people expect me to speak to the people on the polar opposite side of the fence, right? To say, y'all over there need to stop oppressing us. But I like to have a conversation where I call those who show up to the responsibility of doing the work right because we're the ones that's in this. And so, this is another image of when I, I've been to, to Haiti four times now, and I'm from Brooklyn. We don't have a lot of nature, per se, in Brooklyn. <laughs> and so when I saw, I came at night, and when I saw that there was a mountain near the hotel, I said to myself that I would, um, I wanted to see the sunrise, I wanted to see the sun break over the mountain. And so I stood on the hotel in the morning so that I could see this, with, you know, with the excitement of, of just taking that image in. And um, when the sun did break over the mountain, this is what it showed me, right? I came in at night, so I didn't see anything around it. And I felt really complex things, right? Like, I, what, do I, what do I do with this image? What do I do with the kind of narrative that I'm imposing on this image? If I were to share this image, I understand how it would be perceived, right? I'm in Haiti and I'm helping people. Like, what's happening here? Whose story is this to tell? 
these are some of the things that started to, you know, erupt in my spirit. Um, I found out later from some of the local people that it was Habitat for Humanity who came and built these houses very frantically after the earthquake without any conversation with people in the community about what needed to happen. And so with the shifting landscape, the, a lot of the houses started to collapse, right? They came, they built, they left. And so it was this other example of the ways that we are thinking about what does it mean to enter into this work responsibly. And for me, as a black woman, I'm thinking about always the way that black histories and black futures are being inscribed into the narrative of our world. Is it through a lens of deficit? Is it through a lens of salvation? Is it through a lens of paternalism? How are we doing this work? And it reminded me of my time in Uganda. I spent some time in Eastern Uganda. Um, and when I first stumbled upon this school, and I was in my early 20s at the time, and I, when I first stumbled upon this school, again, it was an image that I didn't know, like, whose story is this to tell? How do I enter into this? What is my relationship to this? Well, how do I do this responsibly? How do I unlearn some of the ways that I've been conditioned to read the situation in front of me? This was another one of the schools. And finally, um, oh, I'm missing one. Let me see, maybe skip it. I'll go back to Uzo. Y'all know Uzo? Y'all watch Orange is the Black? Okay, good. <laughs> so this is an image, um, of not my image, because you can't take pictures on Rikers, but of the time that I spent in Rikers working with some incarcerated youth. And um, in sharing this work with somebody, uh, another scholar one day, she said to me, it's so good that you're giving those young people voice. And subsequently, one of the chapters in my book is entitled, If You Think You're Giving Students of Color a Voice, Get Over Yourself. <laughs> right? This notion that these young people who show up powerfully with their own voices from their communities in complex ways that we can't always hear means that we are now thinking that it's our job to go into their communities, into schools, and give them voice. This is some of the complexities that I'm inviting us to think about. I want us to um, hear Uzo out real quick to, to add a layer to the conversation. My family named me Uzo Amaka. That's my full name. It means the road is good. Isn't that a beautiful name? Thanks, Mom. I got it for my birthday. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uzo Amaka. But I grew up in a small New England town. And there weren't a lot of Nigerian Americans living in my region. And I would have teachers or <coughs> anyone, neighbors, try and say my name, and it would be Azumeka, Uzamaka, Uzakuza, any version that they could think of other than Uzamaka. So I came home from school one day, and my mom was cooking in the kitchen, as she is wont to do, the mother of five children. And I said to her, Mommy, can I ask you a question? She said, eh. I said, can you call me Zoe? And she stopped and gave that mother look that only mothers know and have and said, why? <laughs> and I said, because no one can say Oza Amaka. And she looked at me and she said, if they can learn to say Tchaikovsky and Michelangelo and Dostoevsky, then they can learn to say Oza Amaka. <laughs> and I never asked her again. <laughs> and what is amazing now standing in my womanhood, in my power, is I wouldn't change my name for a second. I'm so proud of that name and what stems behind it and what it represents. So do not ever erase those identifiers that are held in you, whether it's your gap, whether it's your name, whether it's your food, it is yours and it was given to you at birth and it is yours to own. One of the reasons that I love um, that little speech that Uzo gave is because it 
illuminates something that the Ken Gonzalez Day image um, is trying to invite us to reflect on, right? That rather than have you accommodate the institution, what does it mean to have the institution accommodate you? Earlier today, I had the opportunity to speak with some young people at Senior Shows High School, and I shared with them that when I first stepped onto the campus at Columbia University, it took me a while to believe that I was, to believe that I deserved to be there. Because it was this Ivy League campus that I knew very well was not built for someone like me. And it was not built with someone like me in mind. In fact, my mother, before she had me, when she first came to this country from Trinidad, she used to, um, she was a caretaker, right, in Harlem. And what she would do is she would, she would uh, take care of the homes of rich white families in Harlem. And she would push the stroller past Columbia University every day and really wonder what was on the other side of those walls. And so entering into that space for me was just confusing. But over time, it became clear that if we say that historically marginalized groups of color have access to spaces, that access cannot mean erasure. That access cannot mean that I deny who I am in order to fit readily into a mold that has nothing to do with me. And so the question became for me, like, wait a minute. Y'all built this without me in mind, so now that I'm here, let's go. How are you going to reimagine re yourself in the service of the communities that were not at the table when these blueprint, blueprints were drawn up? Because then what does access truly mean? And so I love this because Uzo pushes us to think about the kinds of norms and values that we do uphold and accommodate within institutions. Right? We will learn to say Michelangelo. We will learn us some Shakespeare, even though God knows what Shakespeare is saying. <laughs> and so you must learn it. And so I enter this work through the lens, personally, as, a, as an academic activist, through the lens of exploring the relationship between language, race, and power from my own journey. Understanding that when I was younger, it, it became clear to me at certain moments that I was trading off aspects of my identity in order to show up as intellectual within predominantly white spaces. And it wasn't until, for folks who've seen that TED talk, it wasn't until a woman like really stopped me in the middle of my speaking and said, you sound so articulate, that I was like, wait a minute. It really occurred to me that I was not using the linguistic and cultural practices that come from my community and come from my culture within this space because I had been conditioned not to. I had basically been conditioned to not fully exist in order to survive. And so I started questioning that. And in questioning that, I understood that that little game that me and people who look like me are forced to play is a racialized game. It's a political game. It's a game with deep, painful colonial history. And so, this is not about putting up a, you know, Black Futures Month is not about putting up a picture of Shirley Chisholm and Martin Luther King and, and you know, maybe Malcolm X is really wild, and, and, and then saying that we're doing something. It's about challenging our institutions to break the rigid mold that continues to marginalize so many people. Not because we're just dying for a seat at the table, but because there's so much power and brilliance and excellence in the diversity of people all over the world that we are robbing ourselves of. Right? And so, 
This relationship between language, race, and power brought me to think about not just how we read and write words, right, as Paulo Fermi invites us to think about, but how we read and write the world. So what does it look like for me to exist fully in this world? Like, how do I, how does me showing up write something into history? How do we read the world critically? How do we hold ourselves responsible? Because at the end of the day, when it comes to questions, this is the thing that's wild. When it comes to questions of system, so um, anybody ever heard about the book uh, Racism Without Racists? Nobody in this room is going to admit that, you know what, I might be racist. No one ever has that to say, right? But there's so much racism without racists. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to systemic oppression, we use words like that, like we'll say systemic oppression, and we'll say, we'll, we'll use these like really big words, and we act like it's some kind of alien machine acting upon humanity, but it's us. Humans, the nuts and bolts of educational institutions perpetuating harm. How do I know? Because when we flip the lens and we hold our institutions and ourselves accountable instead of the communities and the people that we decide to paint as gruesome, then we shed some light on what's really going on. Here's an example. This is an example of a 2018 um, sign that went viral because it was posted during um, a, a South Carolina high school um, for, during graduation season. And so the sign says, since graduation is a dignified and solemn occasion, graduating seniors and their guests should behave appropriately. Please ask your guests not to call out, cheer, whistle, or applaud during the reading of names and the presentation of diplomas. Otherwise, a citation for your family will be $1,030. Lots, right, because I ain't paying that. <laughs> but what I'm gonna tell you is that if we think about this through the lens of what ideologies, what cultural practices, what norms and what values get to frame graduation as a dignified and solemn event? Because where I'm from, graduation and any other celebration is a turn up, <laughs> right? And I say every time, security will escort you out if you're not turning up. <laughs> so, so the thing is that just by the way this is framed, you've made me delinquent by nature of my existence. From the time I step into the room, you've institutionalized this kind of racial harm, this kind of cultural harm because of the kinds of norms and values that our institutions uphold, and we don't question it. Here's another one. And this is from 2017, but literally just last week, a young man had to be invited to um, the Oscars because he wouldn't cut his dreads off and the, the hair love people said, come through, right? He wouldn't cut his dreads off for school because black hair is being released all over this country for reasons that are beyond me. Um, but this is in 2017, where these two young ladies who are sisters, I believe they're sisters, they got punished, they got suspended, they couldn't go to prom, and they got detention because they had box braids in their hair. And box braids are essentially a rites of passage in the black community for young black girls. Like box braids are just braid extensions. Um, and it's connected to the culture. And like, why were these young women so severely punished for wearing their hair in a form that was just cultural? It's because the institutional policy had language that banned hairstyles <laughs> like that. And so I've introduced this conversation to people and they're like, well, they knew the policy. You're institutionalizing harm. You're asking them to erase themselves and then you're punishing them severely if they do not align with those values. Those are colonial tactics. Those are the same tactics that kept American chattel slavery going. You're gonna get in line and you're gonna behave according to these norms, otherwise you'll be severely punished. My parents are from Trinidad and Tobago. When they were growing up, 
They were under uh, British colonial education and had multiple choice questions on, the, on, on their exams that said, what's the benefit of having the British in Trinidad? And the correct multiple choice answer was to civilize, Christianize, and colonize. The correct answer on their test. This is alongside them pledging to the queen who they've never seen, singing about London Bridge where they don't have nothing like that. Like, what does it mean to be so conditioned by the norms and values of somebody and some people that don't even exist in the way that you exist and to be told that if you cannot adhere to these standards then you will not be valuable, you will not succeed. So I'm inviting us to reflect on this. Because I believe that it is our responsibility, each and every one of us, to make sure that in our work, if we're doing it with integrity, that we're holding ourselves accountable for making sure that we're not perpetuating harm. And there are some important ways to do that. Right? What does it look, what does it look like to hold yourself accountable? Because the same internalized inferiority that I was navigating when I entered into Columbia University is just one component. A lot of us enter spaces with internalized privilege that we don't interrogate. We don't ask questions. We don't think about what it means for us to inhabit space. What does it mean for the University of Georgia to exist on the land that it exists on? Who does that displace? Settler colonialism, one of the most important tenets of settler colonialism is destroying to replace. Some of us are like anti-colonial in our writing and in our speech, and then we like chilling in spaces that have destroyed communities to replace. And we're not asking those questions. And so I do, um, I do want to have an opportunity to like have questions because I like being in dialogue. But the book Black Appetite, White Food is meant to invite us to have tools to start navigating these kinds of questions. It's about paradigm shifts, right? It's about saying, how do I interrogate the lens with which I see the world? And not just say, okay, I'm committed to this work, but not really have the tools to interrogate how I'm engaging in this work. So that we hold ourselves responsible for the kind of world that we want to see. So I do want to, is it, can I open up for questions? Yeah. I want to have a conversation with y'all. So I'm saying a lot of things, I'm showing a lot of things, but I love being in dialogue. And I hope y'all are not shy, because I'm not shy. I just roll up in y'all's face and I'm like, this is what I do. <laughs> and so I really would love to be in conversation with you all. Um, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk before I just keep running off. What's coming up? Hi. Yes. Hi. What, what did you do in Haiti? What have you done your multiple visits to Haiti? Yeah, so I was a part of an initiative there that was uh, working closely with communities around medical and educational support um, because the, the situation in Haiti is, is so dire in so many places. So we, we had a range of medical providers that would go out, and then those of us who were in the field of education and literacy were also assessing the need and that capacity and building relationships with school to build out that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and in that time, I also, because I myself and a friend of mine who were leading the, the visits, I then assigned this book called When Helping Hurts. Um, to the team because we had to really think about that dynamic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? I wonder if you could speak to a notion you maybe think of when you were talking about going to Columbia and saying, do I deserve to be here? Um, and it comes from the spot, so I'm the first in my family to go to college Yes. at all. And mm -hmm. for like a decade I've been chipping away at this goddamn PhD that I almost had. <laughs> <laughs> and as I walked across campus this evening, it's rainy and cold, I was like, look at this beautiful place I get to come and be. Mm -hmm. That I, I, I feel is similar to what you described. And it's this notion, I think, of humility for everybody. 
And so is that something that's come up in your conversations about everybody should embrace that notion of like, what a, what a privilege, I've got this thing, I've worked hard for this thing, I need to capture it and then help others see it, like, I don't know. Yes, so thank you for your question. So there's definitely, so everything, the human dimension that connects us, right? Around the kind of humility that it takes to think about the, what we're able to access and then the responsibilities that come with that. What I'm getting at is the distinctions, the privileges, and, and um, the harm that comes with a racialized existence. Being a black woman in a predominantly white space, I'm navigated differently than you do, right? Um, even as a first generation, just the way I show up, it all impacts how this space receives me, how I'm able to show up in the space. There's a lot of politics there. So the racial politics around how we exist, that's the kind of critical awareness that, that's really important for us to develop. But the level of, of humility and consciousness to understand, like, if I'm in this space to ask the right questions about what it means for me to be in this space and what I'm going to do with that, that's a human question, absolutely. Um, but that racialized existence, and I'm, I'm emphasizing it, I mean, I emphasize everywhere I go, but now we're in Black History Month, so we're going to talk about it. <laughs> and so, you know, that racialized existence is deep. Because specifically, the laws written this, in this country were not just written without somebody like me in mind, it was written against somebody like me in mind, right? Like, so what do you do with that when now we say it's only, listen, I know people walking and talking, having a good time, who we were born well before 1954. 1954 is when they integrated our schools. That's bananas. That was yesterday. And by integrate, they meant, you know, come in and act right. I think it was until 67 in Athens. Right, and then that's, that changes everywhere, right? Um, right, exactly. That's terrifying, like when you really think about it. Um, so all of that, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm here with the privilege of a PhD, like, you know, so there's, there's intersections here, right? So it's not just that I'm a black woman, I'm a black woman with a PhD. Now that's different from the young people that I saw today. It changes what you feel like you have the ability to access. And I said to them, this is the thing that really blew my mind when I realized I was trading off who I was in order to survive in these spaces. Like, my culture is amazing. My cultural identity, the African diaspora, like, epic. Blows my mind. In that TED talk, the message has always been, I'm not articulate because I can master standardized English. Man, is that good? It's because of the linguistic dexterity that comes with all the other parts of me that make me who I am. And so I said to these young people, what's wild is that you're gonna go into spaces that ask you to diminish the parts of yourself that make you the most powerful. And trade it off for something so-so. And then you're gonna believe the narrative that who you are is not valuable because as soon as you stepped into the room, there was a policy that told you so. There was an ideology that framed your difference as delinquents. And so you internalize that. So that kind of internalization is a unique kind of internalization. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yes. Hey, uh, one, super honored. Love. Great to hear you talk. Um, Thank you. Two, so I, I have a, I guess I'm wondering, um, and I'm speaking from my perspective, um, I'm, an, I, my, I'm a first generation immigrant and I grew up in Savannah, which at the time was a very binary sort of community in the sense that it's largely black and white. And so I naturally had to sort of um, navigate my ethnic ambiguity by gravitating oftentimes to black communities. And at, as an extension of that, I, I basically, I started to adopt language that today and I've, I've, it's been told to me that it's, it would be considered appropriative, right? So engaging in um, um, African-American vernacular English to get by and sort of exist in a place where my own community was not present. So I guess I'm wondering how, you, how, how I should think about um, you know, moving from that and growing from that 
know. I appreciate your question. Um, anytime anybody reads a question off a paper, I'm like, oh. Like, <laughs> they wrote it down. Like, it's going to be real. Um, I appreciate your question. First, I want to, and this, this is not directed at you, but I just want to be clear to everyone. Like, I, I don't speak on behalf of all black people, right? So I can't say on behalf of the blacks. Like, I can't do that. Right? This is what you should do. That's not what it's going to be. Um, from my unique perspective, um, the fact that you grew up in community with people and organically developed language practices out of your socialization in that space is very different from cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation speaks to what it means to try on somebody's culture, right? As, as if it's some kind of, it's something you could just put on and take off um, without really understanding and honoring the history of where it comes from. So like there was this video series on Instagram that I loved where there were, um, I think there was like a, like a hip hop dance that was happening and then there were like a, all different kinds of students and like some white students came in the room and then the young black students were teaching them the moves and there was a conversation and the thread that's like this is what it means to appreciate and engage with people as opposed to just being on your own trying to appropriate or copy or not honor who those people are and then when the beat dropped and getting black is not easy, you out. Right? And so being in community, and I'm imagining you grew up in these spaces in family with people, and being socialized in that way is different. At the same time, of course it's important for you to acknowledge that the privilege that comes with you not necessarily having in darkened skin. Right? So that kind of consciousness, but being authentic to who you are, is a political game for you. But you know where you come from and where you are, right? And who you are. And that was developed in community. So there's, there's, there are some distinctions. Every time you engage in a practice that comes from black culture, it's not appropriation. That's not what it is. It's about how we do that, how we engage with difference responsibly and not in exploitative ways. That's the word. So it's very personal for you, like how you navigate that, but that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you for your question and for your um, authenticity. Thank you. Hi. Um, so going back to the um, article that you put up about uh, the families being quiet at the graduation, um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to uh, ask it, what was it exactly that made you feel targeted or made you feel like that was that you were being uh, institutionalized? And I ask this because like I've been to two my, had two of my own graduations as well as been to maybe four or five other ones in my lifetime so far, and I've seen families of you know, all backgrounds kind of, you know, get, you know, loud and rowdy, you know, with their graduate years being called out. I'm, I'm from the same kind of family that you are, you know, graduation is a turn up. You know? right. It's a momentous occasion, so I just wanted to know why you felt like there was being, there was a particular race, I guess, being called out because of this, you know, notice. So, so, in this case, not one particular race, one particular, a particular way of being and knowing that exists across different groups. But I do know <laughs> that, especially, again, from the history of colonialism and American child slavery and the way that it was imposed, that there is a Eurocentric way of knowing about, so I also was raised in the black church. And the fact that there's a black church is telling, right? Like, that's saying something. And so one of the, the struggles in the black church is this tension about how much we can move around or celebrate because when, um, when, the, when the black church was really being like created and, and after slavery when the, the white ministers and missionaries were teaching about scripture, they were teaching it through the lens of like this refined religious practice and this is the way you have to be. And so you'll, you'll see throughout the black community that there are uh, like there's like a Pentecostal approach and there are other approaches that are very expressive that goes against that entire logic, that goes against that entire ideology and then you'll see other people, other um, tensions in the black church around that being deemed wrong, that is not biblical, that is not godly because you're being too expressive. And that's because, that's only because the black church was taught, they were taught by white missionaries, white ministers, that the way that you have to basically worship and behave is this one way. Like, there's a whole tension there, right? So there's a history in the way that colonialism existed 
imperialism existed, American chattel slavery, all of this was disseminated throughout the world, that will talk about ceremony as being refined and still and civil, right? That's the biggest thing. When you go into indigenous communities of color all over the world, everyone is called uncivilized, barbaric. We are loud, we're abrasive, we're expressive, we're colorful, and the idea is to Christianize, colonize, and civilize us, right? And so while there are many cultures, including cultures throughout Europe and all, all kinds of people who are expressive, the ideology, the thinking, the rootedness that would just frame graduation, just name it, like this is what graduation is supposed to be, that's threatening to a whole bunch of people, not just black people, to a whole bunch of people who would otherwise engage in cultural expressions in ways that feel authentic to who they are. But we've been conditioned enough into this stuff to like probably not even question that. Plenty of people, I show them like, yeah, well, you shouldn't be quiet until the names are called. That's just respectful. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, not where I'm from. <laughs> that's cool for you. But that's because that's the, like even this. I'm standing up here and I'm talking to you because I, I guess I'm supposed to be the authority of some kind of knowledge and I'm talking at you and you sit passively by. And, you know, I say something and you nod and you clap politely. Nah, that's not how it is in my community. <laughs> right? And that's why I do a lot of work. I do work with Cypress for Justice. We stand in a circle, we'll push the chairs aside, we'll disrupt the space. We're going to be in a circle and the energy is going to be shared and the knowledge is going to be shared and we're going to democratize the space because this is conditioning. This comes from a particular way of knowing that actually has nothing to do with my history. It was just imposed and now I've just got to do it. Right? So that's one question in here. Thanks for your question. Yes. Um, thank you for the work. And, uh, my question is, like, has any of your work uh, informed or influenced policy that you're aware of um, at any level or any space institution? I would hope so. <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of, but not policy that I'm aware of. But what's wild to me is that the TED Talk in particular um, the Three Ways to Speak English TED Talk, when it went up on the TED main page, which I wasn't like, they told me they were going to put it up, and I was like, okay. Like, I, it didn't really occur to me. The next day, my life was just a different life, right? <laughs> From all over the, the planet, literally countries I've never heard of, people were messaging me to, like, tell me that I was naming something that they felt in their, in their spirit, in their body, in their existence that they couldn't yet name. And they're like, that's what's happening, right? And so that, it started like that. Then I started to get um, a lot of messages, um, mail, images from teachers, all the kindergarten, all the way through college who are engaging in these conversations um, and building it into their curriculum and inviting young people to really understand like who you are is enough when you walk through this door. And to me, that's, that's the most affirming, nourishing, and powerful thing. The fact that there are so many like people on the ground, in the classroom, in the community that feel that, that resonates to, with me um, in a profound way. I want to say more than policy, but I know policies need to change. Um, but that resonates with me deeply. Um, so those are the kind of changes I feel. Yeah, you want to ask something? Yeah, I have a follow-up to that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, so what message would you give to teachers that are in those spaces that carry some of those biases with them? Um, like, I guess, I haven't seen a TED Talk, and I will check it out, but, so what are some of those things that you, I guess, mentioned to articulate or describe that space? What would I mention to teachers about what? Oh, bring, bring um, me on. Yeah, about, like, um, how they carry some certain biases into the classroom that oh, restrict yes. students in ways that you were uh, speaking about. Yes, yes. so I, I work with a lot of teachers on this, right? And um, it's actually a lot of what I invited us to reflect on today. Like, for one, you need to check why you're even showing up in this space. So we know that the racial disparities, there's like, we have a student population that's increasingly diverse, and we have like a 83% teachers are like white middle class, right? It's like very extreme. And so why are you here? Like I ask my students that because I teach teachers straight up. Why are you here? Because if you're here because you're trying to save these kids from something, nah, that ain't it. So some of the first questions is like, what are the ways that you've been socialized? Because this is 
my thing, and this comes up in the book, that we want to talk about social justice, but we don't have self-awareness. We cannot change the world if we're not changing ourselves. And so, why are you here? How have you been socialized? What have you been socialized into thinking about these young people that you're about to work with? Because if it's that you need to come in and they need, they need literacy and they need this kind of nah, come in understanding that they have power that you have yet to access and that this institution doesn't necessarily value. So now how are you gonna navigate that? And that's the message. The message is not how do we fix the children, it's how do we call out the system and make sure that the, the children know that it's the system that's working in ways that don't necessarily, that can't necessarily value who they are. I said to the young people earlier today, I asked them, like, have you ever tried to upload new software onto like an old iPhone? It start tweaking, it start glitching, right? It don't work. Because the hardware can't sustain the power of the new software, right? And I said, y'all are brilliant. Yeah, they, they let us in, 1954. Let me tell you, these institutions, they built on some old stuff. And not necessar they're not necessarily structured to manage, sustain, and capture this power and brilliance, but then, that means we gotta upgrade the institution, not downgrade the students, that ain't it. So, so this is a conversation to, with, with teachers is about what is the lens you're going in with? Uh, because this country's so segregated, so many educators go into classroom having not even been in community with children that look like the, the children that they're about to work with. And I've gotten to the point, because we, you know, we, get, we get it in, when my students, we don't talk, right? You have a real conversation about the fact, like, you're, you're actually, they let me know, like, I'm afraid of this community. You afraid of the community that your school is situated in and that your, your students come from? That's showing up. They know that. It's impacting everything about, you think you're teaching content, but you can't connect with the culture because you're afraid of it. And so that's the messaging. Interrogate who you are as you think about entering into this space. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming, but um, going off of being, um, instead of being a voice and giving back to communities, because like you said, with Athens, there's the community outside of UGA. And when I look at the walls built around UGA, it's not the white men or people who took over UGA and wanted to build the walls. It's the black folks, it's the Hispanics who built the walls that we're in. And in giving back to that, in giving back to the community, instead of being the voice, how would you say we help them? So help me with the second part. So you said the walls were not built by, say it again. Um, the walls were not built by the white men that paid for them. It's built by the Hispanics, the blacks, and the poor community in, in Athens that have built it. And instead of being the voice of those people, how do we be giving back to the community? Because my grandpa and my dad are both immigrants from like El Salvador and Mexico. And so anytime I look at a house, I think about the house that my grandpa built because he was the carpenter and my dad built the walls. And I try to think of a way to give back to my own community, but I don't, I'm not sure how to. So I, I can't say that I personally know the politics around those walls. So I can't speak to it because I don't know. And I don't, I don't want to just speak to something I don't know about. But what I would say is that um, it's important to be working with people and not for people, right? And so in the work that you want to do with people, there is no one way for me to say, like, this is the prescription, this is how you work with people. Be in community with people and learn alongside people what is needed, what is valued, what is felt, right? What, what, is the, what kind of histories are they naming that's not being named inside of these walls? What kinds of needs, what kinds of practices, what kinds of things are being destroyed in order to sustain this space? You're in a community with people and learning alongside them how your wellness is bound up in each other. 
that their survival is connected to yours. So it's not about, I have this privilege and I've come to help you. It's about the fact that, listen, this oppressive, ridiculous system that we've built is harming everybody. And we all have work to do. And so um, it's just that dynamic, right? Of how can you be in community with people and not necessarily be there for them? Does that make sense? And um, in terms of the wall, I'm sorry that I don't know much about it, but I would really, I would love to learn about why, like the, the, the history behind why those walls were built from the people in the community, right? And the politics behind what it meant for this space to be erected and who, were, who was displaced, like all of that history is very important for understanding how institutions need to be called out. The kind of institutional change that needs to happen in order to stop harm and to repair it, right? Um, so I would, I would actually invite you to not help the community, help the institution. The institution is broken. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the message, right? Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Mia? Yes. I appreciate you so much and thank you for your work. Thank you. My question is so I'm African, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and my community has always taught me to play the game, mm -hmm. to get by, to get to the spaces that I'm in right now. And as I've gotten older, I really push back on that and resist that because I just want to show up as myself in yes. places. And so I would ask you, like, how would you advise me to advise those communities that are encouraging people like me to, to you know, be civilized and play this game so that you can get into these spaces? Right. I, I appreciate your question. What country are you from? Ghana. Yeah. <laughs> I just came from Ghana, so I, I feel like I'm Ghanaian now. Um, <laughs> yes. I, thank you for your question. So this is like internal stuff, like intra-racial politics that are like really real. Because um, you have to understand, I, I would say the first step is compassion for our communities and our families. Because you have to understand that the generations before us, they were surviving life and death. We're still surviving, but, but what the tools and the, and the knowledge and um, the approaches that they're trying to equip us with are skills for surviving. Like literally, if you don't play the game, you might be physically harmed, right? Because you might come across as a danger or you might just completely lose access to spaces that tell you if you don't play this game, you're not welcome here. And so the compassion I have for my grandmother and for my aunties and them. I have all kind of compassion for them. And also, I believe that the mantle is on us now to push it forward. It's like, I love you and I appreciate what you're trying to equip me with, but now these institutions are going to reimagine themselves in the service of the fullness of who we are. Because you had the opportunity to step your foot in the door and now we have the opportunity to change the whole system. Right? So we got to bring it forward. And so for those communities, that's the conversation I'm having because there's a lot of internalized inferiority even in our communities. It's complex, right? Like we know we don't. And at the same time, there's a lot of conditioning that says, listen, don't, most of the people that told me don't speak a certain way was from my community. Don't speak like that. Because if you go out there, you're not going to get that job. If you pick up the phone and you're trying to make a professional call, and you sound too black, you're not gonna get that opportunity. And they're not lying. But there's still work for us to do if we're gonna make sure that the generations after us are not perpetuating, are not in that perpetual loop, right? So I really think it's about having compassion, but being in conversation and thinking forward. So I have this really dope shirt that I saw Amy DuVernay wear first, and it says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams, which invited me to understand that like I'm somebody's ancestor right now. What are my wild dreams? What kind of world am I creating in this moment by my existence? What kind of legacy am I leaving? I'm literally here, like I got to go to Cape Coast Castle. I got to go to Elmina Castle, to the slave castles on the, sh on the shores of Ghana, and really like, really look at the shores off which my ancestors left the continent and be like, I'm really here because somebody survived. 
And so I think it's different iterations of that. We're surviving something new, new levels of privilege. I did not get my PhD speaking African American English the whole way. I got my PhD playing the game and also being equipped with the critical consciousness to know that playing this game is not going to give me the access that the pretend is going to give me. And I think that's the con that's the conversation I have with young people now. I'm like, if you play this game and you really believe that playing this game is going to make you get all the way forward, you're going to hit a brick wall and you're going to be in pain. So maintain a consciousness of who you are so that every step of the way where you can find agency and room for disruption and calling out institutions, now I get to teach teachers how to teach African American English, how to teach young people to be their full selves because I played the game and also disrupted the game. It's a, it's a survival. A, I told young people this morning, there's a fugitivity to it. Right? Um, and that's the conversation that I'm trying to have internally in our communities as well. That is like, love, I'll say this last thing. Not far from where I live now in Connecticut, there's some young people who have been advocating to, against their school. Their school has a ban on do-rags. And as you know, it's black and brown students who wear do-rags the most. And so they like taking it to the, a, a matter of policy. Like they're, they're like taking it up, up the ladder because they want to, they're not to not be a ban on do-rags. There's a, a ban on other headwear, but fitted caps and the caps that like white students wear, they're not as policed as the do-rags. So they get to this meeting and they're meeting with a range of political leaders locally and um, they're sharing, you know, why they think that this is a racist policy and that they're being um, penalized for wearing do-rags and that's important to, to their identities. And then the black politicians in the room are the ones who literally push against them. So a friend of mine was like, he, he spoke to me about it. He said, this messed me up because I came there with the young people just knowing. But when he spoke to the black politicians afterward, they said to him, listen, if they keep wearing them do-rags, they're going to be targets. And so then it became this question like, do we want them to wear these do-rags and feel free? Or if they wear these do-rags and they look a little too dangerous, they might get shot dead in these streets. Like, really? It was a, it's a real tension. And, and I, I really, in that moment, was like, I was stuck. And that's, that's some of that, that tension that we're still living through. Thank you for your question. I don't know how much time I have again. I'm just running my mouth, so. Yes. Yeah, um, so I had a question, I guess, about the statement you made about being disruptive, but also playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have for people who are trying to do that similar work, and how do you find a strike balance in that? Um, University of Georgia employs about 10,000 people here in Anishwark County. Um, but a lot of them are low-wage workers. So we have like a lot of Latinx people, a lot of black people doing building service, working in positions, cleaning up buildings. Um, but they're trying to organize a union to you know, help get better work conditions. Um, but there's a lot of fear, a lot of you know, mistrust um, amongst the institution and even some of the union members. Um, so how do you navigate that being disruptive as well as playing the game? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. So one, I don't want to pretend that institutions are just like sitting back ready for change. Because institutions operate the way they operate because it's economically sound, right? And so very often, keeping certain racial groups in their place is an economic benefit for the institution and they have no intention of changing. And that's real. That's a real fight. Um, I'm not saying that we don't step into that fight, but that's real. At the same time, in this day and age, all of these institutions got some fancy mission and vision that have words like equity and social justice and all these words that they have no idea how to live up to. But it's the thing that you need to say now. So there's a um, tenet in critical race theory that's disturbing um, called interest convergence. And interest convergence is about the fact that, you know, gains for black people, for people of color will happen in this country when it converges with the interests of white people. And so I'll play with that at the institutional level. Like, look here, you got this word social justice in your mission. Let me help you 
Let me help you figure that out. Let me get a little funding to help you figure that out. These are some ways that you can add some integrity to this. These are some benefits. I'm not saying that it always works because like I said, some institutions are, are running a certain way for certain reasons, but um, playing the game and disrupting, like those, that's one of the strategies that I've used. Like even right now, myself and a, um, a sister, another sister at, at UMass Amherst, uh, Dr. Keisha Green, we are in the process of launching a new center of racial justice and youth engaged research. And a part of the rationale, like right now, it's, 5% black students on campus, 5% black faculty, there's 26,000 people on campus, right? Part of the rationale is like, um, you need help with this. When the brochure come out, it looks so diverse, it, that's cute. You need help with this, right? Let us help you. Let's get this funded, let's do this work. So that's one strategy. Um, thinking about where, where are the spaces that your interests might converge. It's a little bit of a thinking game. The other thing is that I have a mentor who told me, you need to be mindful, because you know, she knows the work that I do, and she's like, you cannot rely on these institutions to do for you what you know needs to be done for yourself, right? And that's not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps notion, that's a, our communities are powerful and have powerful spaces that also can and must nourish us. My life goal is not to be accepted by some institution. But what are the spaces that we are valuing in our communities, upholding and sustaining in our communities and finding nourishment there? Like those are other ways to garner a sense of influence and advocacy that can like also build up enough momentum to expose and hold people accountable. You know we in cancel culture. <laughs> so if this university get a bad name, like one bad tweet, you know, like one bad tweet can set everything off. I mean, I leverage all of that because if the work is the, the work needs to happen, then it needs to be called out. And also, I think um, I don't necessarily put all my trust in a space that doesn't want to value me in the first place. And that's just me being right. Thanks for the question. Yes. Can you talk about the role of art in your work or in social justice work in general? Yeah. So art is one of my entry points for engaging in what myself and other colleagues have been thinking about and theorizing um, called fugitive literacy practices. So art, spoken word, and the way that I use words and then drawing on the linguistic practice from my community is a way to disrupt um, the standards and norms that come with white middle class English, particularly for me. So, one of the things, because I'm a literacy nerd, one of the things to know about language is that language is not um, ideologically neutral. Language is not just the exchange of words. Language is saturated with history. Language is saturated with, um, with culture. Language is political. And so when you police language, you police more than just words. When I utilize language, when I, when I engage in linguistic practices in <coughs> traditional spaces, in ways that are honor my community, I disrupt the ideologies of those spaces. I bring the whole package, right? Um, and so that's the role for me, like the way that art functions is that it, it for me, spoken word and hip hop in particular, creates room for the parts of myself that these academic institutions won't necessarily create. And then by nature of it embodying and epitomizing a, a, a different sensibility, ideology, epistemology's history is saturated differently when it comes into the space, it changes things. And so when, that's why when working with young researchers and activists in New York City, we'll use hip hop, we'll use spoken word, because they might present their findings, but they're going to present it in bar. They're going to spit it for you. And when they do that, it's going to hit you different. Because if you've ever heard a spoken word piece, a spoken word piece hits you differently than a five paragraph essay. Mm -hmm. You probably fell asleep reading the five paragraph essay, but that spoken word piece was in your spirit for months. And what does that mean about how we limit? 
how we engage in education, right? And so um, I think, and that's just me because I'm like a word nerd. Um, I'm just talking about those, you know, linguistic, artistic um, uh, devices, but visual art, all kinds of art, right? Critical media literacy, there are different ways to engage in, creati in creativity that I think can disrupt our traditional ways of knowing in necessary ways. Yes, hi. Hey, um, as a future educator, um, how do I go about giving value to my marginalized students? Like, they've already been beaten down and told that their, their opinions don't matter. How do I like combat that, since I want to be like a high school teacher, like it's already been ingrained a lot. How do I combat that before they go out into the real world and show them that they have value no matter what nobody says? I appreciate your question. So, at the beginning of your question, you said, how do I give them value, right? Yes, I, I don't, they have value when they right. come back to my classroom. Mm -hmm. I just want to give them like this, um, this feeling like they, they're everything they don't. Mm -hmm. But I want to show them that they do. Yeah. It's just like wiping off like a, a, a layer of dust. Yeah, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. But I just like want to know how I do that effectively, especially in like with larger marginalized students. Yeah. Being a marginalized person myself, but not understanding exactly the different backgrounds that they've all been in. Yeah, I appreciate your question. So, so one, understanding that they have that value and they may be <coughs> believing what they've been conditioned to believe. Um, one of the things that's really important, I just had this conversation with my students because we were talking about asset-based pedagogies. And the way I teach my courses is that we, if we're going to disrupt, we're going to disrupt. So we're going to use hip hop, we're going to use but we're going to engage in our course in ways that don't necessarily feel like what we're used to. And my students were like, they were like tripping. It was so uncomfortable. Um, we ended up moving into a conversation about how we're having, we're having a conversation about asset-based pedagogies and making sure that we're not looking at students through a deficit lens. But then I was like, do you see the assets in yourself? Are you capable of looking at yourself outside of a deficit lens? That was an important first question. Because the way that they shrunk in the face of something that wasn't the traditional rigidity of schooling and they didn't know what to do without rigid parameters. It was like they shrunk who they were, the invitation to be themselves, it, it, they freaked out. And I said, do you understand the value of your own assets? How are you gonna go into schools and work with young people and talk about their assets if you don't understand your own? So that was the first thing. The second thing is that, the reason why we don't need to be there for young people is because they're brilliant and they, they're dope and they know all this anyway. And the problem is that we don't have these conversations with them and then what we end up doing, y'all know what gaslighting is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We like to talk about that and like, we're like, oh, he gaslighting me, she got. We like, we gaslight students when they're literally walking through institutions that are perpetuating harm or the news came on yesterday and they, or there's a viral video of someone who looks like them who just got murdered and they were like, today's subject, and just completely act like that reality doesn't exist. So part of the way that we invite them to understand their value um, is by actually having real conversations with them about the system that is trying to deny them their value. Because they feel it and sometimes they just need support naming it. So I don't, young people know. So being in that conversation helps them to be conscious and help them to know they're not going crazy. The other thing is what is happening in your pedagogical approach in your curriculum? Are they reflected? Mm -hmm. If you say they're valuable, if I'm so valuable, then why the only time I get to see my culture is when you're trying to trick me into learning Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. Don't do that, right? Show me that who I am is valuable here in the curriculum. And so I tell, when I work with my with teachers and we're designing units, I'm like, okay, you have unit goals that are imposed by various standards. What are your goals? Do you have goals that will hold you up to the integrity and accountability of being <coughs> equitable and socially just and, and goals that are aligned with love? 
Put those goals above the goals that the administration gave you so that you can make sure your entire unit is reflective of that, right? So there are ways to make sure that, that they're, they're in the conversation, because even though the system is happening, they can know and it can equip them to navigate it even when they go to other places. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you for your question. Yes? Um, to go off when you were talking here about the inviting change into the institution um, and how, especially the PGA, it's as big of a school it is, and when it comes to what was talking about the unions, how do I, as a student, invite change into an institution as big as UGA? That's a good question. Um, one of the things that I advise, especially around like my history connected to community organizing, is that the first step, the first, did I say step to that? <laughs> the first step. <laughs> of um, engaging in advocacy is building allies. You don't want to move alone. Moving alone just makes you, you can just shot, get shot down as a target anytime, right? And I just mean like, oh, okay, well, she's suspended, whatever. But if you build allies, so a lot of us do this thing. When we want to make change, the first thing we picture is the enemy, the people who are against us. I guarantee you, that there are so many people that are for what you are for. And when you build a community like that, then you can collaboratively advocate and push for change in ways that you cannot necessarily do alone. Like we're building community for that reason. So I would say that as a first step, what you do would be a matter of what is established by that community and that would change for every community. And I invite you to do it in community in community, not just with people here, with people up beyond these walls, so that you can make collective decisions about the kind of change that is best in the service of all of the people. But allies and community cannot be ignored. Not this, you got a cell phone in your pocket that takes video of this university ignoring your needs? You can do some work, right? There's plenty that can be done. But, but I would say as a first step, step build with those allies, and then think intentionally about the kind of change you want to advocate for. Okay, I have one more question. It's not me, somebody, <laughs> someone <laughs> said that we have one more. Who wants to tell me one more question? Hi. Hey, and can you talk a little bit about the work that you do with Cyber for Justice in terms of you know, what kind of projects the kids end up doing and, and the insights of the whole thing is yeah. Yeah. So at my time in Columbia working on my doctorate, um, in the service of making sure that this institution is going to be what it needs to be for different kinds of people, um, I worked with my advisor to create space for hip hop and spoken word and media to be valued at the institution. And so a series of events took place. And in one of the events, I entitled it Cypress for Justice, and he was like, keep that, you know? And then at a certain point, um, we, had, we had like basically high school students from all over New York City coming through, and just thinking critically about the role of high school um, hip hop and education, spoken word and education. And then um, at a certain point, my advisor connected me with who became, um, who is now a co-director alongside me of Cypress for Justice, um, Dr. Lemaris Caraballo, and we together thought about the power of youth research and activism through youth participatory action research, which is a model that is meant to engage young people in the qualitative or quantitative in the research process, right, the academic research process, um, toward activism. It's meant to disrupt whose knowledge has power, because in the academy, especially in educational institutions, the, the theory, the policies that we take in, that we implement, they come from people who don't exist in the communities of the young people that they impact. And so the goal of Cypress for Justice and YPAR in general is to make sure that those young people are at the helm of the conversations and the policies that impact them the most because they're embedded in those contexts and they have the most knowledge about what needs to happen. And so Cypress for Justice was developed in that way. Now traditionally, 
When you have uh, young people learning research, you have young people learning research, which means that they do what we do, which is quite stale, I'll say. And so what we've done, I love what we do, but there's other ways of knowing. So, so what we've done is just to make sure that when you are engaging in this academic practice of learning the research process, you're not limited by the indoctrination of the values of what academic research looks like and sounds like. You're also honoring the fullness of your culture, your identities, your languages. We make sure that we have teaching artists in the room who are equipping us with hip hop writing skills, who are equipping us with, um, with just hip hop culture skills, cultural skills, with spoken word writing skills, with um, critical media literacy skills. Because the way that we engage in this process is also disrupted by who we are and how we show up. So now, my conceptual framework might come to you in the form of a poem. And it'll do something that's a little bit different than the slide that has you know, a nice little chart. Um, but it will evoke something else. And then it gets us to tap into the power of what these different literacy practices and these different ways of knowing bring to the conversation. Um, and so that's the work. So the young people have done projects on rape culture and schools to prison pipeline and environmentalism <laughs> and you know immigration policy, everything under the sun. And um, it's not me. This is not, I'm not trying to fetishize the thing. It's not me, it's, a, it's messy, it's complex. Especially because we're working in, in institutions that have not, there's no mold for valuing this stuff. Um, but some of the insights that have come out of it is just like how profoundly transformative it is for young people when one, they understand themselves as powerful leaders. Because in the space, it's a youth-led space. That's part of one of like, part of the epistemological orientations of YPAR is that we don't even do the raise your hand and I'm going to call on you. I'm not going to give you permission to speak. We call ourselves adult allies. And so you're leading the conversation about what is relevant and valuable for your world. And you watch them evolve and literally say things like, it's weird that y'all are listening to us because no teacher has ever listened to us. What? Right? And so th some of those insights in into what it means to honor young people's voice and how they transform in the process have been very powerful. Um, and they're just really great young people that I want to work with. Thank you. And thank you in general. Thank you for having me. Thank you.